to mitigate the microbial proliferation in the hatching cabinet, formaldehyde has been widely used, in, at least in the U.S., since the early 1900s. Um, and it's quite effective when it's being used, um, but it's non-selective. So um, mm. it, it does very well to control microbial bloom until it's stopped, which is typically 12 hours before hatch pull um, due to worker safety concerns and that type of deal inside the hatching cabinet. So once that happens, you can see that microbial bloom start again because it doesn't sterilize the environment. It just keeps it, keeps it at bay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt podcast, where we share the latest in poultry nutrition research and industry trends in approximately 10 minutes. My name is Sam Rochel. I'm an associate professor of poultry nutrition at Auburn University and one of the hosts of the show. Uh, very excited to uh, join, uh, be joined by uh, Mitchell Rowland today from uh, University of Arkansas. Uh, so Mitchell and I have known each other from my previous uh, position at Arkansas. Uh, actually, um, work together in a class and uh, have, have known you throughout your program. So I uh, look forward to talking with you today uh, and hear what you've been doing, you know, since I left there and, and what you've been up to. So uh, good to good to see you, Mitch, and uh, look forward to the conversation today. Yeah, thanks for having me on here. I'm excited. You bet. You bet. So I know uh, you've kind of straddled uh, the fence between uh, industry and academia. You know, you've been in graduate school, you, you completed your master's working on a PhD program now. You're also employed as a, as a program associate at the university. So you've kind of been wearing two hats for the last uh, few years. Um, so I think you have a, a neat perspective. And I uh, also think, you know, you're working on a very applied area around, um, you know, hatchery sanitation and alternative to traditional measures of hatchery sanitation. I mean, Food safety is such a hot topic, uh, even bleeding definitely into the nutrition world these days. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in this area? I think I probably should provide a little bit of background about what's going on in the hatching cabinet, just so it makes a little bit more sense. Um, sure. Most people know um, that these conditions in these hatching cabinets are nearly perfect for microbial proliferation. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, there's, you know, a high load of microbes coming in on the eggs through fecal matter or broken eggs or uh, whatever may be stuck to those eggs when they come from the, from the breeder houses. And so you mix that with the high humidity, the high nutrient availability, the, the high ventilation, you have perfect conditions for aerobic microbial growth. Mm -hmm. um, and then even, you know, Later in hatch, as the chicks begin to pip and actually hatch, the humidity spikes again. Um, nutrient availability goes up more than it originally was through, you know, dander and other material coming off the chicks as they're hatching. And this leads to what we uh, refer to as a microbial bloom. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, so um, prior to hatching, um, probably prior to even uh, moving into the hatching cabinet from the incubators, uh, microbes can make their way into the uh, inside the egg um, through micro fractures or pores, um, and then this can lead um, to exploding eggs. Yeah, what it's commonly yep. referred to. Um, if you've ever been in a hatching cabinet and you hear pops that that sound uh, kind of like a cap gun going off, that's that's what's that's what's yep. happening. And so when that happens, you know we're spreading large amounts of material to eggs next to it, and then smaller aerosolized particles from that process can be spread throughout the hatching cabinet. So to mitigate um, that, not to mitigate the exploding eggs, but to mitigate the microbial proliferation in the hatching cabinet, formaldehyde has been widely used, in, at least in the U.S., since the early 1900s. Um, and it's quite effective when it's being used, um, but it's non-selective. So mm -hmm. um, it, it does very well to control microbial bloom until it's stopped, which is typically 12 hours before hatch pull um, due to worker safety concerns and that type of deal inside the hatching cabinet. So once that happens, you can see that microbial bloom start again because it doesn't sterilize the environment. It just keeps it, keeps it at bay. Um, the literature also shows that uh, this process can lead to damaging of tissues, especially in the trachea of the mm -hmm. neonates that have just hatched, which, um, could lead to future opportunistic infections once they're placed on the farm. Um, and then from the exploding egg perspective, formaldehyde doesn't really penetrate the eggshell. So it can't really get in there and control 
those eggs that have been contaminated. Mm -hmm. So to kind of mimic this, um, a study was published by Dr. Graham in 2022, um, where she utilized um, hatchery associated or poultry derived path opportunistic pathogens as models um, to kind of simulate the, the bloom and that exploding eggs uh, that we see in the hatching cabinet and then uh, evaluate the effects of formaldehyde and its ability to control that bloom. Mm -hmm. um, this was, like I said, a mixture of, of a couple up to six model opportunistic pathogens. Um, and it was applied, um, that mixture was applied to the air cell end of the egg at day eight or day 19, I'm sorry. Um, and then a variety of selective and non-selective medias were used to sample the hatcher environment, uh, the gastrointestinal tract, um, fluff and dander, and I think even in that study, they did some egg washes. Mm. Uh, and so for this model, you know, we're not using commercial sized hatching cabinets. We're using a smaller um, 250, 300 embryo hatching cabinets to where we right. can have multiple treatments and, you know, sample that environment and have a little bit more control. Um, so for the uh, part that I've been working on um, alongside colleagues in the lab is using that model to evaluate um, bacillus uh, amyloliquefagians as a potential alternative uh, to formaldehyde fumigation. Um, we wanted to evaluate the ability of these isolates to uh, mitigate the microbial bloom mm -hmm. uh, compared to formaldehyde. The two that we used had previously been uh, evaluated in vitro for their ability to um, inhibit some of the pathogens, opportunistic pathogens that were used in the model, as well as some that weren't. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at, um, for the for the portion that I've been working on, the uh, mixture of pathogens contained uh, two E. coli isolates. Um, one was hatchery derived, one was field derived, um, an Enterococcus faecalis and a Staph aureus, both of which were hatchery derived. Mm -hmm. So we set up a series of studies um, using that model. Uh, they had five treatments in each study. So we um, had like a, a negative control, which was just the eggs that came from the hatchery at day 18, just so we could see what was coming in uh, to our model. Mm -hmm. And then a challenge control, which was a pathogen mix um, onto the egg to evaluate what our pathogen mix actually did without any uh, sort of mitigation efforts. Mm -hmm. And then formaldehyde uh, treated challenge group and then um, a challenge group treated with either one one or the other of the bacillus isolates. Um, from this study, uh, we, we sampled the environment at four different time points. So 20% PIP, 50% PIP, and 80% PIP, and then right before hatch pull. Uh, those PIP points were kind of estimated based on the number of hours. Um, but that was those samples were taken uh, through an open auger plate, just put through a port on the side of our small hatching cabinets, okay. and kind of just exposed to the environment. Yeah. Um, we also collected the gastrointestinal samples on day of hatch, right right after hatch pull, and then um, fluff or dander from the inside of the hatching cabinet um, right after we pulled hatch. With science-led solutions that are sustainable, proven, and effective, BASF helps you tackle the challenges of poultry nutrition. We offer high-quality feed ingredients that enable a more sustainable production and help you achieve your animal performance targets. We call it the science of sustainable feed that succeeds. Before you get into the results, just to be clear, how are you applying the, the isolates uh, into the, the cabinet or on the eggs? So the bacillus isolates were uh, a product of a dry fermentation process. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly wheat bran, rice hulls, and then some uh, minerals in there to mm -hmm. promote growth. So that's... That process is they're, they're grown on that media for a couple of days and then they're dried to induce sporulation and then ground. Mm -hmm. um, and then that dry product is applied into the hatching cabinet um, at one gram per application. Um, we did four applications. Each one of those applications had uh, 10 of the 10 colony forming units of bacillus spores yeah. in them. Um, so, uh, do the you can do the math to to figure out what uh, per egg that was. I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm sure it's in a presentation somewhere, but it's pretty high. Sure. But when we're you know when we're looking at something on this scale, right? You know, people think that's kind of high for a probiotic or uh, something that similar. But we're not, we're, you know, we're not trying to go into the feed, so we don't need a ton of it, literally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We need a few grams. Um, right. Yeah. To maybe a kilo for a hatching cabinet. So. Yeah. 
makes sense. And so when you say you're applying it, how you're actually, so it's a dry material, right? How, how is it actually distributed into the environment? So on the, the side of these hatching, small research hatching cabinets, we have a little mm-hmm. applicator that uh, there's a tube going to an actuator that will apply a 10 second burst of compressed air. Mm-hmm. into that applicator and yep. basically blow it into the hatching cabinet right in front of the fan so that it will circulate it throughout. Uh, so that's really neat, Mitchell, and I'm sure uh, our audience would like to hear more about that, but we're getting close to our time for today, uh, for today's episode, so we'll, uh, we'll sign off on this episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast uh, and pick up with the rest of the story in the next episode. Uh, but in the meantime, I thank you for joining and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Again, my name is Sam Rochel. Uh, here at Auburn University, signing off from the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast.